Well, I'm ready to give you a complete history of the Bible. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's see if we can do this in the amount of time that I have allotted. Here it goes. In the book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth, and he made man, but man rebelled. And God wanted to establish a relationship with Abraham in chapter 12 and to develop a nation in a promised land. And he takes that family and his son Isaac and his uh, grandson Jacob and then Jacob's 12 sons became the 12 tribes and leads them into Egypt. By the time we get to Exodus, 400 years has passed and these people, these people are down there and they're crying out for God for help because they are slaves. And God delivers them from, the Egypt, through, from Egypt through Moses and brings them to the promised land establishing laws and sacrificial rules. This takes 40 years for them to get there to that border. By Joshua, the time of Joshua, they are led in there into the promised land. The enemies are taken out and they establish that new nation. But we see in the book of Judges that they don't do a very good job of keeping God's laws. In fact, they have forgotten all about God. So God has a new plan. He's going to go through David as a king. We see that in Ruth and in First and Second Samuel and also in First and Second Chronicles. He raises up David as a king, and we begin to see that David shows the heart of God to this nation. And he's one of the greatest kings of that promised land. When First and Second Kings rolls around, Things are good with David's son, Solomon. And Solomon really develops the wisdom and the infrastructure with the temple and all the things that were needed to have peace with all the other nations. However, by the time his son, Rehoboam, goes into power, Rehoboam makes a bad decision and the nation splits, a civil war, dividing them into the north and into the south. Ten of those tribes of Jacob go to the north, two are in the south. And God judges the northern nation of those 10 tribes by sending Assyria in to wipe them out. And they are scattered all over the land. And this happens around 740 BC. And then God judges the southern nation. And it wasn't, they were not doing a very good job either of two tribes by sending in later Babylon to wipe them out, destroy the city, and to take the people into captivity. This happens around 597 BC. We see all of this in First and Second Kings. But during that time, when the enemies were invading in the north and in the south, God communicates to his people through prophets. And these prophets were specially selected men who were given words in order to say to the people and warn them and to tell them what God wanted them to do because God had greater things for them. One of those prophets was Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet during the time of four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. This is the southern nation of Judah that he was speaking to. And um, we know that Uzziah began his reign around 770 B.C. and Hezekiah ended his reign around 690. So this is a time span of about 80 years. And Isaiah was born during the Assyrian captivity. And he was prophet during those 80 years. And all of this is 700 years before Jesus Christ came to the earth. Now, why would God give this information to Isaiah? Well, the, the people at the time were scared. They had seen what had happened to their northern brothers. And they're wondering, what's going to happen to us? And Isaiah was saying to them, unless you get your life together, you're going to suffer the same kind of judgment. But God was not going to just judge them and give up on them. He really had a plan for them, a greater plan for them of obedience. In fact, the bigger plan was not just to save the country, but was really to save all people. And that plan was Jesus Christ. And during this sermon series that we're calling Cross Reference, we want to take a look at those glimpses of Jesus in the Old Testament, especially as we head up into Easter. So we can see that Jesus wasn't just something that happened in the New Testament, that there was a plan all along for him to come throughout the Old Testament. Now, some say in terms of prophecies, there are about 44. 44 that are very clear, direct prophecies throughout the Old, uh, Old Testament. Some say there are 354, very specific ones that sort of pinpoint different things that happened in Jesus' life. Look, four prophecies would be amazing. But uh, one book, but the most prophecies, Isaiah. If you're in that camp that says there's 354 prophecies, then 124 of those are in Isaiah alone. And we're going to look at every one of them right now. <laughs> well, it's going to seem like that. And uh, I'm going to be out of breath when it's done. But uh, there is a lot. 
And I want you to leave here, especially if you're one that's saying, can I really put my faith and hope in Jesus Christ? And I want you to, as we're reading all this, to see very clearly that what Isaiah was saying is cross-referenced directly to what was happening in the, in the Gospels. And that you can say, wow, throughout all of that time, he was able to pinpoint this. And maybe that has some relevance for my life today. Well, let's look at the first one. We're going to talk about the birth, the life, and the death of Jesus as seen in Isaiah. And it begins with Isaiah 7. It's going to be important that you have those scriptures in front of you and you're looking at them as we move through this. Isaiah 7, we're going to begin with verse 13. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. This would be the Jewish people. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. And he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. Now, sometimes in prophecies, there is a near fulfillment, and then there's a far fulfillment, a, a future fulfillment. So Isaiah is saying this right now to the people of that time um, in order to communicate something to him. What is it? What is the near fulfillment? Well, the prophecy centered around King Ahaz, around Jerusalem at that time, and from the attack from Israel and Assyria. What he's saying here to Ahaz is that in that time span, it takes for a child to refuse the evil and to choose the good in order to get to that age of accountability, so to speak, where they really sort of understand right from wrong which would be for what most kids, three years? I don't know. Maybe you're new to two. I don't know, whatever it is. But in that short sort of time span, he is saying that Assyria would be crushed. And this was a sign of deliverance to Ahaz. So when Ahaz hears that, he's going to say, wow, within two or three years, Assyria is going to be crushed in the north. I'm going to know that that fulfillment came true. But there's a future one too. And of course, we read this at Christmas time because we know so clearly what it says, that the far fulfillment is that a miraculous virgin birth would occur. And of course, that would be Jesus Christ. There could be no other person that ever lived that can make that pronouncement, that their mother was a virgin. It's so clear the cross-reference in Matthew 123. Matthew, the gospel writer, requotes uh, Isaiah 7:14 and says, look, a real virgin occurred and gave birth to a son, and that son is with us right now. So God can do the impossible is what it is saying. And he wanted to do the impossible to prove that this was uh, the Messiah that we were waiting for. The idea of him being Emmanuel is saying that is God with us. That's what, that's what that word means. God is with us. Not just sort of in the room and in spiritually and we can feel him in our heart. Not that kind of thing. What is it saying? He is physically going to be with us here on the earth. And that's what the birth of Jesus Christ meant that he would be here with us. As it goes on, we see Isaiah 9, 6, just two chapters over. We read this too at Christmas time. For to us, a child is born. For to us, a son is given. Well, who is this child and who is this son? And was he really born to us? Is that what it's saying? Well, he did not come as a fully grown man, which have made things a lot easier, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it have been great just to appear at 30 years old saying, here I am. I didn't want to go through all this diapers and that pimple stage and, and all that hard work to survive as a carpenter. I'm just going to show up right now. No, but Jesus, Jesus was born and uh, he came to us as a child. He came fully human, which is the child part of that prophecy, but he came as a son also, which really shows his heavenly part, that he is fully God, man and God in one person. This is the God man. There'll be nobody else like him ever born before. And it says also here that the government would be on his shoulders in verse in Isaiah 9, 6. Well, did Jesus run for office? No. Okay, it doesn't seem like that one came true. He didn't want the government. He wasn't interested in the government. In fact, if he ran for office now, he probably wouldn't even make the straw poll. But what he was saying, what it is saying here, there will be a time. There is actually a future fulfillment for us right now that at one time he will be on that throne. At one time, this little child born on the earth will one day sit on the throne of heaven and forever rule the earth when he returns once again. The government right now doesn't want him to be uh, in control and they're gonna do their own thing, but there will be a time where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. As this goes on in Isaiah, there's four different descriptions and it says that he will be called 
Every one of them describes Jesus perfectly. First of all, it says that he will be called the wonderful counselor. Was Jesus a good counselor? Absolutely. The words he uses, I use in my counseling sessions that counsel me at times when I'm afraid or depressed or worried about what's happening. Things like, come to me, those who are heavy burden, and I'll give you rest. Or I am the way, the truth, and the life. Or things like, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. All of these help us with our emotions when we are troubled. He's a great counselor. He's also a counselor in the sense of a legal sense that we would need a defense attorney to stand between us and the judge because we are guilty and we're standing before a judge who's looking at us saying we are guilty of our sins and we're going to be sentenced, but here comes a counselor, the one that stands between us and takes up our case and says that we are not guilty because he has paid the punishment for our sins. Where will you find the cross-reference of this? I would, here's a good place. It's very familiar. I think John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Look at all of John 3 if you want to read that and see what God has to say about his relationship with his father. So those are two sets of verses about his birth. Let's look at his life. We have two sets of verses for that also. And you're going to go to Isaiah 11. And turn to chapter, uh, chapter 11 and in verse 1. It says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. Well, if you have a stump, you've cut off the tree. There is no hope for that stump to grow into anything. But it is saying that a little tiny shoot is going to come off of it. What is this saying? Well, Jesus did come from the stump or the family tree of Jesse. But it had been cut off when there were no longer any kings in the line for the southern nation. See, every king since David had been a descendant of David. But when that nation fell apart, it was cut off. And for 600 years, there was nothing until Jesus showed up. And as we look at uh, 2 Samuel 7, 16, it says, Your house and kingdom, this is God talking to David, Your house and kingdom and throne will endure forever. And David's going like, really, forever? How would that be? Well, not, not necessarily on earth, but certainly in the spiritual realm in heaven forever. Because coming from him in his family line, his father is Jesse, and David's family line, coming starting from Jesse, would have the king of kings, Jesus Christ. Uh, also, the cross-reference is Luke 1, 32 to 33. It says, he will be great. and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. David's father's Jesse, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So here's that little branch coming off from that stump that had been cut off from 600 years. And then in verse 2 here, it gives a description of what he is going to be like. And there are seven descriptions here of, 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 of understanding what he's going to be like. And it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. It says, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Well, how do, do we see all those descriptions in who Jesus is? Absolutely. The spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. And here's a glimpse here of the Trinity. Because all of the things that we describe the Holy Spirit as a comforter, the advocate, the counselor, the teacher, the intercessor, Every one of them we describe as Jesus also. And in that previous description of Isaiah, when it gave the four different ones, him being a mighty God, an everlasting father, and a prince of peace, we're trying to put that all together. How is he going to be God, and how is he going to be father? Well, Isaiah 11 explains it even more and brings out the Trinity too and says the spirit of the Lord is going to be on him. And so with a combination of those two verses, we see the Trinity come to life. This is a mighty God described in Isaiah 9. The mighty God is a father, is a son, and is a Holy Spirit. Did Jesus have the spirit of wisdom on him? Yeah. He spoke with great authority at times. He spoke with parables. The people didn't understand when he originally spoke, but later on they went, oh yeah, I get it. I get what he's trying to say. He had great depth when he taught. Did he have understanding? Oh, he had discernment, especially when the Pharisees were trying to trap him. He knew what was up. He knew what was going on. Did he have a spirit of counsel? Oh, great counsel. He gave great advice. There were times when people were hurting and confused, like the Samaritan woman, and he counseled her. 
What about a spirit of might? What we see in Isaiah 9, 6 is going to be a mighty God. Do we see might here in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. He had a spirit of power, not of timidity, but of power. We see those in the miracles, calming a sea, walking on water, feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000. That's a lot of might there. How about a spirit of knowledge? Well, he's all-knowing. He's omniscient. The spirit of fear of the Lord. Oh, yeah, great submission. That's what that means, fear of the Lord, submission. He submitted to his father, only, only wanting to do his father's will at all times. The cross reference to this that speaks about this spirit of the Lord we find in John 1, 32 to 34. And the John that's speaking here, says John gave this testimony, is John the Baptist. And he's saying what he saw at that moment when he baptized Jesus. He says, I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The spirit of the Lord physically, in reality, descended upon him, but it was also within him and the characteristic of who Jesus was. The next group of uh, verses of prophecies that talk about his lifetime was Isaiah 53, 2 through 3. So go to Isaiah 53. And it says here that he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. Well, what is this saying? Well, Jesus grew up. And for 30 years, he didn't really make a lot of commotion. In fact, Luke, who really gives some insight into his childhood, really doesn't have a whole lot to say. And he probably interviewed Mary. It seems pretty clear that he interviewed Mary to find out some of these details. And Mary says, yeah, there was just that one time when he was 12 in the temple where he says, didn't you know that you would find me in my father's house? That was about it. Besides that, we didn't, he really didn't give a whole lot of indication. Just like a tender shoot would grow. Anything that grows doesn't make a lot of noise or make a lot of commotion, especially the roots in the dry ground. If you try to listen, you don't hear a whole lot about it. And that's the way Jesus grew up very, very quietly. He didn't go off to meet with imams and shamans and faraway places. He just lived and grew up and to understand life, to experience life so that he could say to us, I know what it's like to be in that situation because I too lived on the earth. This is what makes him a wonderful counselor. It goes on to say that he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, and nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. This is the only time we get any hint of what Jesus actually looked like. Now, a lot of us would like to think that Jesus looked like this. He did not. In fact, if you followed that Jesus, it might be for the wrong reasons. And some of you are lusting right now, And that's not good, and you're feeling guilty because you're in church lusting after some guy, an actor who's playing Jesus. This is uh, Diogo uh, Morgado, okay? He is an actor, and he is married, too, so now you're committing adultery. And he has kids, too, and that's even sicker. So this is not the Jesus. We would follow that Jesus. We go, man, he's a good-looking guy. I want to hang out with the good-looking guy, but that's not it. It wasn't his physical appearance that attracted people to him. In fact, every leader where their physical description is given failed in some great way. King Saul, he was a tall man. King David, he was handsome. Uh, King Solomon was probably handsome. His father was David. His wife was Bathsheba, which was described as beautiful. Plus, he was very wise and very smart, which probably would attract a lot of people to him also. But every one of those, when we see their physical description... They failed. So it was probably so that Jesus was not attractive in that sense, in a physical sense. Where did his attraction come? From inside, from his love for people. However, as he showed his love, we see what happened in verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. He responded with love. There were people, the people responded with hate. They were disgusted by him and the things he said. And of course, all of that led to his death. What's the cross reference here? Luke 2, 52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. 
He grew up. He developed into a fully mature person like anybody at the age of 30. He chose to live here for all of those years on the earth so he could experience life. And during that time, he had favor with God. In fact, God said to him two times straight from heaven, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Well, as we said, all of the, the birth and the life and all of that led to his death. And what happens in Isaiah 52 and 53, as you read this, you're looking at this and you're going, wow, was this transcribed while the crucifixion was happening? Was somebody sitting there writing this all down as it was occurring? Keep in mind, this was 700 years before Jesus was on the cross. Yet it is very clear that the prophecy for his death um, is here. And in Isaiah 52, 13 through 14, it says, See, my servant will act wisely. Jesus acted wisely. He will be raised and lifted and up and highly exalted. Was Jesus lifted up? Yes, he was on a cross. He was lifted up. Is it something that's highly exalted? Well, the people at the time weren't highly exalting him. But later as we look to it, and in a month when we celebrate Easter, he is highly exalted for what he did. And just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Was that Jesus on the cross? Oh, the beating he went through, the whipping he went through, the crown of thorns. His face was probably puffy. Uh, there was probably blood dripping all over it. And at one time, you know, people thought, is this the guy that we knew before? He doesn't look anything like it. And then the prophecies for his death go on in Isaiah 53. You start with verse 4. It says, surely he took on our pain and bore our suffering. That's why Jesus went to the cross. He died our death of separation between us and God. He took it upon ourselves. He suffered for us. Yet, it goes on to say, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. God put the punishment of sin on him so that he was afflicted, not us. Verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Literally, pierced for our transgression. Pierced by the nails that nailed him to a cross. He was crushed for our iniquities. It was for our sins that he was beaten and bloody. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. He was the Prince of Peace, as we saw earlier in the description of him in Isaiah 9. The Prince of Peace, and here it is. This is the peace that he's going to give, that we now have peace with God. No longer does God have anything against us because our sins have been forgiven, because Jesus took on the punishment. We now have peace with God. By those wounds that he took on, by sacrificing himself, by bleeding the sacrificial requirements needed for a sacrifice, he took that on, and because of that, our sins have been healed. Verse 6, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. That's true also. We, we like sheep, are always sort of straying and finding other things that we think are more important. But Jesus is called the good shepherd, the one who brings them all in and says, do not go your own way. Go my way. My way is the only way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All the sins were placed on Jesus for all of us, for all time. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. We see in the Gospels that when he was before Caiaphas, for, uh, for Herod, and before Pilate, that he did not defend himself. Remember, he has much wisdom. He's a wonderful counselor. He could give good advice during this time, yet he did not. He kept his mouth shut because he needed to die. So he accepted the false charges. It said he was led like a lamb to slaughter as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. John the Baptist, when he saw him, said, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin in the world. And during that time of the death, it was the Passover. They were preparing the lamb to be sacrificed at that time to celebrate Passover. And Jesus was dying at that exact time so that he was a lamb going to slaughter. By verse 8, it says here, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Um, in fact, nobody spoke up in his defense. Many betrayed him, getting him to that point, looking out for their own interests and not his. 
For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. What does that mean? He, was, he died. He was cut off from the land of the living. That all of this physical abuse that he went through eventually led to his death. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Well, he was in a grave. A grave is meant for sinners. And he was placed in that grave. In terms of the rich in his death, it says that Joseph of Arimathea asked permission to take him down and put him into his grave. And Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man. So he was in a rich man's grave. And though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, he never hurt anybody. He never slandered anybody. He always spoke the truth. Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Jesus died as the offering of all sin for all time. And verse 11, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Yes, he will be assigned to the grave, and yes, he will die, but guess what? He will rise again. It says right here that what we're about to celebrate on Easter, the death and resurrection, was clearly outlined right here in Isaiah 53. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. We are now justified as we stand before God because all of our punishment has been taken care of because of what Jesus has done. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. We do consider him great. He is one of the strong. He is the mighty God that was referenced before because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Well, he poured out his life as a sacrifice. Was he numbered with the transgressors? Yes, two, a thief on both sides. And he died with them to say that I am dying with them as I am dying for all who are sinners. For he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. One of the descriptions of Jesus is always the intercessor. And there he is once again as that counselor standing between us and God, interceding for us, taking on the punishment for himself. Isaiah is making this point clear. Where's the cross reference? Open up any of the gospels that talk about the death of Jesus Christ, especially Matthew 27, 32 through 61. It's clear that we are all sinners and Jesus died for our sins. And across is two lines that come together. And the intersection right there we see that brings that cross together is Jesus Christ. Through the Old Testament and the New Testament, he has fulfilled them both. Think about that 700 years once again. That's the amount of time before Columbus discovered America. Imagine if at that time someone were able to give a prophecy for someone living today. And we were able to read about it in such great details we just did. We would say, wow, this is amazing. Who is this person? Who can make all these things happen? And it's God alone. God wanted to cross-reference the birth, the life, and the death of Jesus so you could know him today. Does it really matter today? Is this all sort of stuff that was just fulfilled 2,000 years ago has no relevance on, your, on my life? Absolutely it does. If you were like the people of Isaiah time and you wanted comfort from God, uh, you were scared. Oh, I don't know what the future is. God's able to say, I know the future. I know the future in great detail. You can trust me. And what if you're depressed? Does God really care about me? Well, he sent his son to die for you. Are you worried about what's going to happen next? Look, in that time span of 700 years, that's like seven lifetimes from then. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knows what's going to happen within your lifetime, within the next few days and weeks. Just trust him with that. What about death? What happens to me after I die? His desire is that all would see the light of life with him. That as Jesus resurrected, he promised to bring those who uh, believe in him to be resurrected with him. Can he do the impossible? Absolutely. Not only the virgin birth, which is the impossibility, but to make all of these things come true in such detail. So God does have a plan for you. And just as he can... It may be 700 years in the making to get where you're at today, but you need to be within God's will. He didn't just come to save people. He came to save you. And God is with you. That Emmanuel, God is with you, promises to be with you right now. And he promises also that he would die for you. But the question here is, do you believe? Do you believe 
in the evidence that has been laid out here today.